This is the fifth video in the Propositional Logic module for Foundations of Computer Science. My plan for this video is to briefly go over the concept of logical consequence, and I'll define it, give some examples, and then I'll end with a formal definition of theories and theorems, and a short discussion of what it means to be an axiomatizable theory. These are topics that we do not cover in a lot of depth in this course, but that I think it's good to have some awareness of because they help connect the material we're looking at to broader work in logic and maybe also give a sense of how this study relates to theories and theorems of interest to mathematicians. We spend most of our time in this course talking about how logic relates to computer science, but if you put this all together, I think there is some payoff in that you begin to develop a larger picture of how all these fields tie together, and there is a way of seeing things in which logic plays a special role in this relationship. Logical consequence is defined as a relationship between a set of formulas and a single formula. So we start off with some set of formulas U and an arbitrary formula A. And we say that A is a logical consequence of U if and only if every model of U is a model of A. So in other words, every interpretation that satisfies a set U will also satisfy A. In symbols, we write this using the double turn style with the set of formulas U on the left and the formula that is a logical consequence of this set on the right. The effect of this definition is analogous to a generalized version of the implication in that what it means is that if this relationship is true, then any assignment that makes all the statements on the left true also makes the statement on the right true. So we just use this same symbol, of course, uh, to express validity, but in that case, we didn't write anything on the left side. This is actually very consistent, as you'll see when we get a bit further, because if U is the empty set, then this is exactly the same thing as saying that A is valid. So rather than write A is a logical consequence of the empty set, we just sort of drop the left side of the statement. The way that I like to suggest that people think about this relationship intuitively is that it's like we're saying that A can be thought of as a valid statement once we've already agreed to ignore all of the interpretations that don't satisfy our set of formulas in U. When we say A is valid in general, that means it's true for all interpretations. When we say it is a logical consequence of U, that means that it is satisfied by a potentially smaller set of interpretations, which is determined by U. So that's why I'm saying the effect of U is to reduce the number of interpretations that must satisfy A in order for this statement to be true. This is a bit abstract, so I think an example will help. So let A be this formula, P or R, and not Q or not R. And let U be this very simple set of formulas that includes P and the formula not Q by itself. So what we want to know is, is A a logical consequence of U? This would be a good place to pause and reflect if you want to try to answer this on your own. To figure this out, the first thing we need to know is what interpretations satisfy U. So this is actually very easy to determine in this particular case because U is very simple. Clearly, P has to be true and Q must be false in order for this to work. So we can just add those two assignments to our interpretation. And notice we don't say anything about R. So it could be that R is true and it could be that R is false. So we now have two interpretations that would satisfy our set U. Now all we need to know is whether these interpretations satisfy A. So we can check this by plugging in T for P and false for Q. On the left, this means that we have true or R. So this whole thing certainly becomes true and it doesn't even matter what R is. On the right, we have not false. So that becomes true. And then again, we have true or not R and it doesn't matter what R is, the whole thing will become true. This gives us true and true. So the formula evaluates to true and our interpretation has satisfied the formula A. And notice that since it doesn't matter what R is in either of these cases, we don't really even have to check it. We know for sure that both of these interpretations are going to work. And so therefore, the answer is yes, A is a logical consequence of U. However, A is definitely not a valid statement because if we were to consider an interpretation that assigns false to P and false to R, then this whole expression on the left would become false and A would become false. So it is certainly falsifiable and therefore not valid. 
I pointed out previously that there is a distinction and also a connection between the bijection symbol and the symbol for logical equivalence. And the same thing is true for the implication symbol and the symbol for logical consequence. The implication symbol is an operator in propositional logic, and it appears in the formulas of propositional logic. The double turnstile symbol, on the other hand, like the equivalent symbol, is a symbol for a concept in the meta language, and it conveys a relationship between a set of formulas and a formula. Having said that, we do have a theorem that relates these two symbols, which is that A is a logical consequence of U if and only if the conjunction of every formula in A implies U. What this means is that if I take all the formulas in my set U and I write them out, for example, let's say U is a set P, not P, or Q, Q and R, and A is the formula Q implies R, then what we're saying is that each of the formulas in U is some individual formula A sub I with subscripts. So A sub one, A sub two, A sub three, in this case, there's only three of them. And if we write them all out and connect them with logical ands, and we end up with a combined formula that looks like A sub one and A sub two and A sub three implies A. And that is just an expansion of this expression here with this big and symbol in the beginning. So then substituting the actual formulas will give you this one big new formula that says P and not P or Q and Q and R implies Q implies R. We can add parentheses just to make clear which parts come from which of our formulas in U. And what we're claiming in this theorem is that you can always do this and the formula that you produce this formula here will always be true if and only if A is a logical consequence of the set U. To give you another example, recall that we just recently showed that the formula P or R and not Q or not R is a logical consequence of our tiny set of formulas P not Q. So in this case, our U is this set of formulas on the left and A is this whole formula on the right. And it follows by the theorem that I just gave you that this whole formula that we can produce here, P and not Q implies P or R and not Q or not R is valid. That's what this symbol here denotes. This is valid, meaning it's true under all interpretations. And here again, our A sub one is just this P and our A sub two is this not Q, just connecting this back to the notation on the previous page. Next, uh, we have two more theorems in the same spirit as our theorems pertaining to satisfiability of sets from the previous video. These provide some facts about how logical consequence is affected by adding or removing formulas from the set U. The first one says that if A is a logical consequence of U and you create a new set by adding some formula to U, A will be a logical consequence of this set also. In other words, you can't break this relationship of logical consequence by adding formulas to the set U. The reason for this is that the definition of logical consequence is just that all interpretations that satisfy U must satisfy A. So when you add a formula to U, you want to think, how does that affect the number of interpretations that satisfy U? The answer is that it either doesn't affect it or it reduces the number of satisfying interpretations. In other words, the relationship is something like this. As we increase the size of U by adding formulas to it, that's what's happening on the x-axis here, the number of interpretations that satisfy U is going to either remain constant or go down. And so roughly speaking, the more things we add to U, the harder it becomes to satisfy. But making things harder for U makes them easier for A. If you reduce the number of interpretations that satisfy U, you also reduce the number of interpretations that A has to satisfy for a logical consequence to hold. It's like if A already passes five different tests, it now only has to pass four of the same tests. You'll never be adding a new interpretation that A might not satisfy. Now, if you go the other direction and you start removing formulas from U, in that case, you might have a problem, right? You might be creating a situation in which more interpretations can satisfy U. And in that case, we would no longer know whether A would satisfy the new interpretations or not. 
However, what the next theorem tells you is that in the special case where the formula that we remove from u happens to be a valid formula, then in that case, a is also definitely still going to be a logical consequence of the remaining set of formulas. The reason for that is a valid formula is satisfied by every interpretation. So we know it was not adding any constraints as to which interpretation satisfy u. And therefore, removing it does not introduce the possibility that we've added some additional interpretation that now satisfies u that we would have to check and see, you know, does this satisfy a or not. In other words, when you remove a valid formula from u, the interpretations that satisfy u won't change at all, and therefore a will still be a logical consequence of the set that remains. The idea of logical consequence is really a fundamental idea in logic, and one of the things that defining it allows us to do is give a formal account of what we mean by the words theory and theorem. This is kind of interesting because we've been introducing and proving theorems, but we didn't say yet what a theorem is. So our definition of a theory is just a set of formulas. We can use fancy T to represent it, but it's a set of formulas that meets a special condition. In particular, we say that a theory is a set of formulas that is closed under logical consequence. And this idea of closure is identical to what you encounter in arithmetic, for example, when you say the set of natural numbers is closed with respect to addition. What it means is that anything that we can reach by applying this operation always remains inside the set. That is what we mean here also. A theory is a set that is closed under logical consequence. And that means that any formula that is a logical consequence of the set is included in the set. The way we say this is that if a formula A is the logical consequence of our set fancy T, then A is also an element of T. So a theory is a set of formulas that is closed under logical consequence, and that means that any formula that is a consequence of the theory is also contained in the theory. So now that we've defined a theory, the definition of a theorem is very easy. It's just an element of T, or in other words, a formula that is a logical consequence of our theory. When we begin to study a new theory, one thing that people often want to know is what are the axioms? If we have seen a definition in this class of axioms in post systems, and this is a slightly different way of looking at things, but the basic idea is the same. An axiom is like a starting point for the system. It's something that we're going to accept as true at the outset. And you notice when we worked with post systems that you can usually choose different axioms and still get the same system. And the process of finding a suitable set of axioms for a theory is called axiomatizing a theory. Now, just as a side note, we're taking a very formal point of view as to what an axiom is here. There are other different views about what an axiom should be, and that's not something you'll run into in this class, but I just wanted to point it out in case you happen to encounter them at some point. So if we have a theory T, we say it is axiomatizable if and only if there is some set of formulas U such that every formula in T is a logical consequence of U. And we're writing that as T is equal to the set of all formulas A, such that A is a logical consequence of U. The formulas in U are the axioms of our theory T. And if U is a finite set, then we say T is finitely axiomatizable. For example, Euclidean geometry is a set of statements that are the logical consequence of five formulas. Piano arithmetic, which is one way of expressing the foundations of arithmetic that you're familiar with, is axiomatizable, but not finitely axiomatizable. It uses an inductive method to produce an infinite number of axioms. That concludes our foray into logical consequence and the wider world of theories. As I said at the beginning, this is only a minor part of this class, but it's an important aspect of logic and foundations of math, so I think it's worth being aware of.